Stefan, uh, thank you so much. It's so nice to see you and to talk to you and, and make interview with you. And uh, you were a, um, a reporter, a journalist of a uh, national uh, TV channel of uh, Belgium in uh, Russia for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, a long time ago. <laughs> and long time ago. And uh, when uh, di did you start working in Russia? Um, well, I start. I started working in Russia uh, when it was still Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, in in the eighties. Uh, but then I worked from Brussels, so I went there for one week, for two weeks, uh, for special occasions, for example, the, uh, the big meeting, the summit between Reagan and Gorbachev mm -hmm. in 88, uh, I think, uh, then the, the, the last party congress uh, before uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, that kind of events I did. And of course, I made a lot of uh, reports about uh, Glasnost, Perestroika and so on. Um, but then, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, I uh, started as correspondent in, in Moscow. So mm -hmm. I was working, I was living permanently in Moscow, uh, 93, 94, in the famous Yeltsin years. Do you remember your impressions about uh, last days of, of Soviet Union, and, um, about a democratic movement, maybe, in Russia? Well, of course, because I, I was rather often there uh, for this purpose. Uh, well, of course, nobody could predict the collapse of the Soviet Union at, at the end of the 80s, at the beginning of the 90s. No, I don't agree with you. It, it, it were people, it were persons who uh, predicted a collapse. Yes, but a, a complete collapse and the end of the Soviet Union, I think it was very difficult really to... Well, uh, for example, you had uh, Hélène Carrère d'Ancos in, in France who predicted it, but in another way as it, as it really happened. Um, so uh, you could feel that a lot of things would change. And of course the, the way uh, Gorbachev and part of the leadership at the time um, just permitted the uh, countries in the former satellite states of the, of the Soviet Union in Central Europe uh, to go their own way, it was already a sign that something big would, would change. Um, but for me, the atmosphere of enthusiasm, uh, when I was uh, attending, for example, uh, rallies, electoral rallies of Boris Yeltsin, uh, I felt something that was so strange to me as a journalist. I was, I was following it um, theoretically here from Brussels and in practice there on the spot already for years. But I could, when I spoke to people, the way they were eager to have this change, but a really a big change, not a small change, because Gorbachev was uh, doing a good job. Uh, a lot of Russians wouldn't admit it, and still now they, they think uh, Gorbachev was, was a bad leader and, and was responsible for all the bad things that happened to, to, to Russia and to the Soviet Union. But I think we have to find a modified way to, to uh, analyze his reign, his, uh, his five years or six years in power. Um, but that's, that's Gorbachev. But uh, what, what was very special then was the way people part of the, of the Russians and of the Soviet people wanted to go to advance more quickly in the way Yeltsin uh, uh, suggested uh, radical changes. And that was for me the, the most interesting to see and to talk with these people uh, how they really wanted something. They couldn't describe what it was, but they wanted something like democracy. As I, I repeat, they didn't know what democracy meant. And I think they still don't know what it means, uh, because, and now I make a, um, a leap of, of, of 10 years, uh, what they went through in the 90s, uh, they, a lot of Russians still think that that was democracy. No, that was chaos. And so that's why in the mind of a lot of Russians, uh, democracy is linked to the Yeltsin years and to the negative things of these Yeltsin years. The chaos, economic collapse, uh, poverty, uh, um, the, the power of the, the mafia, uh, of bad politicians. And that's in the mind of a lot of Russians linked to democracy. And that's why a lot of Russians still today uh, don't want uh, 
this kind of democracy to come back, and that's why they, they support Putin. Uh, I think that's the background of the, the big uh, power of Putin, because in the West a lot of people say, well, Putin is a dictator, he, uh, but well, he was voted in by people, and of course there can be some electoral fraud or whatever, but you cannot manipulate elections in this big way as the way he, he won every election, every election. So he is still popular. Why? Because, uh, well, he replaced this chaos of the 90s by kind of orderly state and um, a good economy. Well, in <laughs> the, the, the first 10 years of his, uh, his reign, um, of course, it was not completely due to his uh, way of, uh, of policy, to, to his policy. The, 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 the oil prices, prices had, to, had had a lot of, to do with it, and and a lot of other aspects that were not uh, really linked to his his policy. But still, the people conceived it as uh, with Pu uh, Putin getting in power, everything went better. And effectively, if you come to, I I, I was not in Russia for several years, and I came back for a series of documentaries in uh, 2011. And I couldn't believe my eyes how really things had changed in a positive way for not only for the rich ones, because in the 90s a lot of uh, people uh, <laughs> became better, but it were only the very wealthy and, uh, and the corrupt people and the criminals, and they um, uh, came out of this chaos with, with uh, good things. But ordinary people in Russia and in the rest of the Soviet Union in the 90s, they suffered. And that changed. With Putin, it, I repeat it, it was not completely due to the policy of Putin, yeah, but yeah. due to a lot of circumstances, all, all of a sudden it became better. And so people, uh, a lot of people, uh, when, when I talked to them in 2011 for this, uh, this series of, of reports, told me, yeah, well, thanks to Putin, now we have a good life. We can buy an apartment, we can go abroad to travel, we can buy a car, which was impossible in the 90s, in this period of democracy. Yes, yes, yes. He's lucky. He's lucky, I guess. Yeah, well, um, a, a lot of things helped him. Yes. And uh, I think what helped him the most was this negative uh, image of the period of the 90s with a lot of Russians, and for a reason. Yes, mm. it's true. And maybe uh, the uh, collapse of, uh, of the Soviet Union w was not uh, f full, so it w was some um, you ch can, you, change. Yeah, yeah, you cannot change a whole system mm. overnight. Eh? And, mm. and, and also the people, the, there were still a, peop a lot of people from the previous regimes, uh, from the previous regime, who remain in power, they just put on another cap yeah. and they continued. A lot of communist bosses, leaders from the very low level to the high level, they became business people, they yeah. became uh, factory owners and they became rich and they used their former contacts from the Soviet Union, uh, domestic contacts and international f uh, foreign contacts uh, to make their own business to become rich and to, beco to become influential. Yeah. And of course, the oligarchs in... in, in uh, I even uh, met some, some guy of... Um, uh, but I forgot his name. A very influential uh, person whom I interviewed uh, at, at the end of the Soviet Union, somewhere at the end of the, the 80s, uh, who, who was the... the oh, I, forgot, I forgot his name. Well, anyway, I saw him back a few years later and he became a, a businessman and he, he was a political leader before. So this kind of case has happened a lot of times and, and that's how, um, in fact, offi well, officially, uh, um, the, due to all the events, due to the collapse of, of, of the Soviet Union, uh, the system, the communist system disappeared, but a lot of... Um, mechanisms and a lot of uh, personal influences remained and that's 
the, 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 this example of Russia and of the collapse of so Soviet Union and the way it, it, it uh, uh, still existed afterwards is not unique. Uh, it, uh, a lot of revolutions have such a, a kind of backlash afterwards uh, uh, because you, you, you cannot change over, overnight and you cannot replace all the persons who were responsible uh, with, with new persons. And even if you have new persons, it doesn't mean necessarily that these new persons are good because they lack experience uh, or they are just, they have bad mind or, or, or bad, uh, bad intentions. So uh, <laughs> the pity for former Soviet Union for Russia is that all the bad things that can happen after a revolution happen there. Yes, yes. And people uh, support uh, such uh, kind of uh, regime, such kind of leader. So. Well, um, <laughs> some Russian friends always told me, uh, 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 some Russian friends told me that in Russia uh, people always support a leader, whoever it is, and uh, they only support the new ones once they are elected, which is very difficult for someone from the opposition to become a new leader. Uh, ah, I will vote for him once he's elected. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, so uh, that's why it's that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult for uh, Russia to, um, to go a through a real change. Yeah. And, um, and uh, maybe a lot, of, uh, a lot of Russians have their doubts about, about Putin. Um, when, I, when I go to Russia and I speak to either uh, tour guides or friends or whatever, um, very often I hear, yeah, well, we all know that um, the regime of Putin is not right, and, uh, but how to change it? And um, we cannot, at this moment, we cannot vote for the opposition because this opposition leader or that opposition leader is not experienced and is, uh, uh, he, he still has to learn a lot and uh, um, it's not the right moment to have this change because the economy is still developing. So there are a lot of reasons not to vote for real change. Um, which means that well, people like Putin remain in place. Yeah. And, and, well, <laughs> it's a little bit sad because uh, Russia deserves better. And, and <laughs> but it's also difficult to let people understand, and people have to understand it themselves, that democracy is not what they went through in the 90s. So uh, I can understand that people have their doubts because they, they are afraid to go back to, to that period. But in some way, at some point in history, and it will, it will, uh, it, it will happen, they will understand that um, this democracy is something different than what they went through. But I like uh, uh, those period, 90s. I work, uh, I work hard, I work a lot for 14 hours a day uh, on, on money and I work for myself, I worked for myself. It was a good time. Um, and it, it was um, freedom too. That's true, that's true. But that's something a lot of people uh, don't care about. Uh, because I asked this question when I made this report four or five years ago, uh, a lot of times, but you had a lot of, uh, you had a lot of freedom. Uh, there was free press, there was uh, freedom of speech in the ELT years. And people said, yeah, but what do I buy from, from it? For me, I don't care about freedom. I want money. And for us, it was impossible that's what the people then say, uh, to, to earn, in, a, in an honest way, to earn money in, in, that, people, in, in that period. And uh, we only went, became poorer after, after the collapse and in, in these first ten years after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. So, uh, 
That's true, because that's, for me, the, the most wonderful thing that happened after uh, 91 and, and all the events, uh, is that the, you could feel the press freedom. Press freedom that already was developing under the last years of Gorbachev, last years of Soviet Union. Because when, when I was making reports then, I, I also couldn't believe my eyes when I spoke to people and I realized that some people were more willing to really give their thoughts, their ideas to journalists and moreover to foreign journalists than in, in my own country. <laughs> so I've, sometimes I felt there was more freedom or more eagerness to express the, the opinion amongst the, the Russians, the Soviet people, than, than in, in, in Western Europe. Uh, so that gave me a very good feeling and some hope for, for the future. And indeed, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this continued and, and you had more and more uh, free press and, uh, and well, for example, the NTV, the, the, the independent television station that, uh, uh, that was created. It was amazing. Yes. When I was when I was watching, and at the time I was uh, I was learning Russian, and, and, and more and more and more I could understand uh, the the news bulletins and and the, and the background programs. At, uh, and, and I was really so uh, enthusiastic, and, and it was interesting for me to watch this because less and less I could feel difference in journalistic approach between. Uh, uh, NTV and also a lot of newspapers, new newspapers at the time, radio stations, Echo uh, Moscow, for yes. example. Uh, for me, it felt like it was yeah, a news media like, like in, in the West. So there was less and less difference, yes. and that gave hope. But of course, this hope was completely broken after the year 2000 yes. when, when all, all the important and influential independent uh, news organizations were. Put under, again under the control of the state. Yes, yes. And it, it, it was uh, TV6, it was Good Channel 2, mm -hmm. and, um, and some yeah. others. And, yeah. and local media too was uh, independent. Yeah. And uh, yes. But uh, now you work in, you change the, the country, uh, you change the location, and now you work in uh, China. Would you tell some words about your work in China and uh, can you compare the situation in China and... Uh, it's very Russia? interesting because the Chinese, they learned a lot from what happened in the Soviet Union and, and, and later on in Russia. The leaders and, and the present day leaders of China, they were le really studying this history of the former Communist Soviet Union because they wanted to prevent that the same would happen in China. And the Chinese already at that time did exactly the opposite. What did uh, Mr. Gorbachev do? He wanted to change everything at a slow pace and first he wanted to change uh, the mentality of the people, the politics, he wanted to introduce freedom, slowly on and then he was hoping that the economy also would follow pace and that uh, the economy would change but he, he didn't want to to introduce too much changes uh, uh, on the economy uh, he did it in a low level uh, the uh, free free market was uh, allowed but for a shoe repair or for a taxi driver or for little restaurants but the big state enterprises were remained untouched for, for a long time. Maybe that was his big mistake. The Chinese did it completely the opposite way. They started to overhaul the whole economic system and they said, they told the Chinese, from now on it's good to become rich and forget about all the things that were not allowed until now. Everything is allowed now, but only concerning the economy, concerning business. What happened? Very quickly, relatively quickly, after 10 years, 15 years, the Chinese began to feel that real changes were happening because they became 
not rich, but their life became better and better, especially compared to the terrible years from, from Mao time where, where they were all poor. But what the Chinese did not do was what Gorbachev was doing, giving them also political freedom, freedom of uh, opinion, freedom of press. No, that was completely uh, out of the question. But for a lot of Chinese, and still now, that's not important, because they, uh, they feel that it's going in the right direction. They become rich. And actually, the same as what was happening after Putin coming in power for the Russians, things became better from the economic uh, and the social point of view. Well, in, in China, this happened before. Really. And uh, just like in Russia, where a lot of people say, okay, there is no democracy and Putin is an autocrat and a kind of dictator even, some people say, but we don't care because we get richer, we, our life becomes better. That's the same way as the Chinese, most Chinese don't care about the lack of democracy, lack of press freedom, even the, the, all the limits on, on the internet, they don't care because they live better. Uh, so that's a, a big parallel with um, what happened under, under Putin in, uh, in Russia and, and in China. And, and so the, the, the Chinese, they really also like how Putin is doing things in, in Russia because that's their way. And so they, Xi Jinping, the, the, the president of, of China, is getting along with Putin very well. Uh, you see, it's every time uh, they, they meet each other and they, they yes. learn from each other. Uh, what about uh, relationships between uh, European Union, Russia and China? It has to change. It, uh, uh, there has to, to be a way to get out of this, uh, this blockade of, of uh, developing relations. The problem is that um, the European Union didn't enough to try to understand yeah. the Russian way of thinking, not only Putin, because I don't think you have to understand or agree with Putin, yeah. but uh, <laughs> concerning, for example, Ukraine, uh, a lot of Russians don't understand what uh, the European Union is doing and the other way around. So both sides, they don't see that, well, the Russians don't see that the European Union didn't have bad intentions with Ukraine. They, they, they wanted Ukraine indeed to put Ukraine on the way to once in the future join the European Union, but not as, as uh, something against the Russians. But for a lot of Russians, that's, that's what they feel. The European Union is against Russia, so they want to incorporate uh, uh, Ukraine. And what e European Union and European leaders don't understand is that uh, amongst a lot of Russians, and not only Putin and his clique, uh, there is a feeling that, for example, Crimea, what happened in Crimea, for them it's not a political crime or whatever to, to, to take it back, because that's how a lot of Russians feel it. They just took it back because it was uh, only part of uh, Ukraine since 1954. So for a lot of Russians, that's, that's not a big deal. And, and even what's happening now in, in the eastern part and with all Nova Russia and whatever, whatever is happening for, for a lot of uh, Russians, it's also not a bad thing because they feel it as uh, um, a kind of protection of the um, of, of the Russians in, in, in that region, and of course they are influenced by, by propaganda, uh, both from from the, the rebels in, in the eastern part of Ukraine and by Putin and, and his regime. But um, <laughs> maybe the European leaders should have uh, tried to, to understand this psychology and this political psychology. Of, of the Russians, and not only to blame it on uh, the bad policy of, of Putin, because it's not only that, it's, it's, it's far more than that. And also, uh, maybe there was too much uncritical support towards uh, the new leaders in, in Ukraine, because uh, they are not saints. <laughs> so, Again, there is this back and white, and, and, and it reminds, really, well, 
a lot of newspapers have, have talked about the new Cold War. Well, it's not not really new Cold War because then they don't know what the Cold War really was. That that was really bad. But of course, compared with um, the, the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and even the, the period of the first years of Putin, the relationship between uh, Russia and and the West and also European Union deteriorated in, in, a, in a dramatic way, and this has to change. And, and they have to find ways to to talk again, uh, because it's always the, the only way to get out of the of a situation is not to fight and, and not to to deliver uh, arms to to the Ukrainians or uh, from uh, on the other way on. Um, the other side, uh, from Moscow to to help the the, the rebels with, with mil military means. No, the only way to get out of it is, is to talk. Because in the end, anyway, you have to talk. What should uh, European Union do to understand Russia and how to deal with Russia? Well, you can't. Uh, <laughs> you can change your way of thinking in, in, in a few minutes or in a few days, of course. Eh? But, but concrete steps. Well, uh, I, I think, but I'm not a politician, so uh, I always have doubts about um, hard actions like, like sanctions. Huh? Uh, uh, because sanctions usually are not felt by the politicians or by the people in power or by the people against whom the sanctions are meant, but usually sanctions are most felt by the population. Which means that the population uh, then turns against, in this case, the European Union, because, and especially with, with, with the propaganda that the Putin regime makes and, and uh, the, okay. uh, all the bad things that happen and, uh, and the, the deterioration of the uh, economic situation in Russia is explained as, well, it's, all the sanctions are to blame. No, it's, it's also the policy and, of course, also the drop in the, in, in the oil prices. Uh, that's, that's, that's also a reason for it. But for, for Putin, uh, they, they explain it to, towards the population as, well, that's the sanctions. So, also, these sanctions lead to uh, more hostility amongst the people, the, the ordinary Russians, okay. against the West. And that's not good, because then you, you get to a, a situation, a polarization of, of uh, the two nations, of the two parts, and, and you never know where it can lead to. Okay, so first step is uh, cancel. Uh uh, sanctions. I don't know whether it's the first. The first, you have to talk, I think, <laughs> and and you have to. Okay. Well, uh, well, the, uh, the, the Minsk is, uh, Accord was was a good basis, but then you have to continue. You have to invest a lot of time and a lot of interest. But yeah, there so many things are happening in the world, and and uh, I can understand that that uh, that leaders cannot be fo cannot focus all the time on on one question, but it's important. I think. For the European Union, for our countries, for our populations, Russia is a very important part. It. It, it was called strategic partner, and, and it is, it still is. So invest a lot of time and, and, and money in it. Uh, and well, you, you have to accept that the next years you still have to deal with Putin. So let's not waste these years because it's a waste of. Uh, waste of time, waste of money, waste of trust also. And, and trust is very important. How did the relationship between uh, the West and, uh, and, and, and former Soviet Union and, the, and, and now Russia uh, became better? Okay, but what concrete steps? I what don't know. That, that, that's something politicians have to, have to find out. I'm, I'm not going to advise... But you uh, are a political journalist. And you, you have deal with politicians. Yeah, yeah but it, it, that's, that's why I say I'm not going to give advice because I'm a journalist. And a journalist is not someone who has to tell it has to go like this. Because then I would become a politician. Oh, I can only sometimes journalists I know, uh, but I'm not like that. Establish countries. <laughs> and I know a lot of uh, journalists have uh, uh, plans or even, even become politicians. But that's not. Uh, I'm. I'm observer, 
and I can only say, well, this is not the right way. And in my experience uh, with what happened a long time ago, or, or I can say this is not the right way, but I'm not going to say then you have to do it like that because then I'm on the, on the other side of the barricade. Then I have to then I have to become politician. Uh, would you like to make uh, an an interview with uh, with Mr. Putin? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, of course. What what uh, would you like to ask him? About? What ah what what yeah. I like to ask him? Yes. Whether he knows what democracy means and whether he thinks it's a good or a bad thing. That's one of the questions I would ask him. Because I, I even don't know for sure whether he knows. Maybe he's, he's like a lot, a lot of Russians who, who don't know what it really means and how important it is to uh, express your views in a free way. Of course, it's, it's very naive of me because I'm sure he knows and he doesn't want democracy because then his power will be eroded. Uh, but still, I, I want to ask a question. And then this could be a good starting point for the rest of the interview. <laughs> uh, okay. And as for uh, Xi, Xi Jinping? Uh, actually the same, because uh, I think that there are a lot of similarities between the, between the two. Uh, although, of course, uh, China is a completely different country with different, different background, history, culture, and so on. Uh, but uh, from the political point of view, of course, they have a, a similar evolution. The last, uh, well, for China since since uh, the end of the the 40s. Um, but of course, well, in 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 China there are a lot of uh, uh, other things that are uh, interesting. I, I would, if, if I if, would ever get an interview with Xi Jinping, which is completely impossible for Western journalists and, and especially for a journalist of a small, small broadcast in, in, in Europe, if they ever give interviews to foreign media, then it's to the BBC, to CNN, Al Jazeera, the, the big well, Al Jazeera. No, because Al Jazeera did for them bad things in China. <laughs> so, uh, no, so the big players, so uh, small journalists will, will never get an interview. But still, if, if I would, I would, yeah. well, it's, it's about the concept for the future also. Because I'm sure that at one point also China will, um, will let, let free speech freedom uh, of press uh, be introduced slowly on. I don't know when. It will not be in five years or in ten years, but next generation uh, or the next generation, they, they will have to do it because it's a logical evolution. So I'm rather optimistic. I'm very pessimistic about the situation now. In, for example, Russia-Ukraine relationship between the West and, and Russia, but it will also uh, change because um, generations will take over, and that's 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 a problematic thing that uh, Putin has found a way to remain in power. But already Medvedev. There was a change. There, there was a difference in style. Of course, he was a puppet of, of Putin as a, as a president and now as a prime minister. But uh, you could already feel some difference. And with time uh, progressing uh, and new generations coming to power, it will also change. It, it's inevitable. But of course, I, I'm not able to predict when it will happen.